Well, good morning. Uh, last week, uh, Joey Bottoms preached for us. I'm thankful for him, our, our youth pastor. And really, we have several guys around here that all preach. The quality of preaching never goes down when I'm gone. Uh, but I am glad to be back with you today. Joey said that I gave him the single hardest passage in all of Galatians to preach. And I think I probably did. It wasn't intentional, but it was really challenging. And I feel extra bad because the passage that I get to preach for you today, I believe, is the most profound passage in all of Galatians. Now, I know the entire Bible is inspired of God. It's authoritative. But of all the passages in the entire Bible, this passage has had uh, perhaps the greatest influence on my life. And so... uh, No pressure. I've now set it up. It's got to be life-changing or it's not going to be any good, right? Well, hey, let me tell you about my life. I was raised, if you don't know, I was raised in a really wonderful household, two godly parents. I grew up in this church. It's an interesting thing to preach to people that once changed your diaper in the nursery, so that's quite a joy. I am glad that I I get to be here, Uh, but something that people didn't know about my life growing up was that uh, as a very young man, Uh, Some things happened to me sexually that I never told my family about. I was far too young to know how to deal with or to process that. And, And I didn't even understand all of what was going on, but I did know that it was wrong. And from the time I was a pretty young boy, I had this sense of shame that I carried with me. Uh, I I knew that these things had happened and and nobody talked about these things and I just kept them myself. And as a result, I carried this weight of shame and I really began, because of that shame, to have this belief about myself uh, that I was a bad kid. I must have been a bad kid kid because of these things that had happened and, and I never told anybody or, or anything like that. And so I just carried that with me. And that really, it began to affect me. It affected my behavior. Uh, if I ever had you as my teacher or in this church, whatever, I, I still owe you an apology. I was kind of a hellion as a kid and, and lived that out. I remember being in junior high and I spent weeks at a time in detention. And, and Patty Clay was my teacher, y'all. And she's not even that, that rough on you, you know. And so um, lots going on in my life. I'll never forget freshman year of high school, my teacher, whom I had never met in my life, English class, first day of freshman year, she's calling the row. And you know how classrooms are usually set up where teachers, the desk are in a row and they usually face the teacher's desk over there and they're in a nice little grid pattern. Well, my teacher is calling the roll and she gets to Jason Waymire. I'm a W, so I'm toward the end of the roll and she goes, ooh, uh, Jason Waymire, I want you to get your desk and I want you to bring it up here facing mine. And so I sat for the entire year with my desk touching hers and everybody else back behind me. And so my reputation had preceded me. I believed I was a bad kid and I often um, fulfilled that quite well, right? Reinforced it in my mind. But here's what happened. When I was a freshman in high school, God did a really significant work in my heart that was unexplainable to me. Like I didn't understand all of what God was doing, but he was doing something in me. And I'm, I'm as surprised as anybody watching how God was transforming me. I knew that my desires were changing and I'm just kind of sitting back watching it happen. Like what in the world is God doing? And so I started, by God's grace, I started reading my Bible, and I, for the first time in my life, I wanted to go to church, and not just because there were pretty girls or whatever, like, I wanted to be there, I cared about the things of God, uh, I didn't have quite the same rebellious heart that I'd had before, and, and y'all, for a kid who had felt really bad about himself and believed that I was a bad kid, uh, I started to feel a little bit differently. As a matter of fact, I remember one day I'm standing in the hallway, and you know the teacher's doors, they kind of open out into the hallway, and so I'm standing here talking to my friends, and I hear that teacher, the one that I had to sit with my desk touching hers, um, I heard her talking about me. And you know someone says your name, you listen. And so she was talking to another teacher, and she said about me, she was like, you know what? It's been really great to see the change in Jason. And I think that he's really trying to seek the Lord. And for a kid who felt pretty bad about himself, y'all, that felt pretty good. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, maybe I'm not such a bad kid. Maybe I'm a good kid. And I didn't realize that in that moment, that transition that happened from seeing myself as a bad kid to seeing myself as a good kid, I'd really made the same mistake in two forms. Because I began to pursue feeling like a good kid, 
I went to church, I did the right things. Y'all, I, I went through all of my high school and college career. I never touched alcohol or smoked cigarettes or dipped snuff or did all the things that my buddies were doing, right? All the things that you would say, hey, I'm a little more righteous than everybody else. This is what a good kid does. I was doing the good kid things. I went to church to help with vacation Bible school. I went on mission trips. In college, I started to serve my church. God even called me into ministry, and I'm like, let's do this, right? I was living a pretty good life by all external appearances. Uh, The problem, though, was that I was starting to trust in my own goodness. In the same way that I believed about myself before that I was bad, I then started to believe that I was pretty good. And some of you that I went to school with, I probably looked down on you and thought bad things about you because you weren't as good as I am, right? That's what I believed about myself. So I started in ministry. Life is good. I'm investing in students. All is going really well. And I'm believing I'm a really good person until I did the thing that no good person would ever do. I did the thing I swore I would never do. I engaged in inappropriate conversation with a woman who wasn't my wife. And y'all, that was devastating. On a number of levels, it was devastating to my wife who had loved me so well and been faithful to me and trusted me so much. And I just blew her trust. I treated it like it wasn't valuable. It was devastating there. And it was devastating to my family, my church. I brought shame on them, to the people that had known me. I brought shame to the name of God. And if I'm being really honest, it was devastating to me personally because I could no longer entertain the illusion of my own goodness. It was a really painful moment in my life. I remember sitting in my closet, I'm just down on my knees before the Lord, and I'm thinking, ministry's probably over for me. And I'm not sure my marriage is gonna make it. And I'm not sure I deserve it to just crying out to the Lord in the midst of that brokenness. And do you know what occurred in the midst of what I would say is the worst thing that I have ever done? God ministered to me as he never had before. You see, when I stopped believing in the illusion of my own goodness, I started seeing more clearly the goodness and the love and the grace and the mercy of God. He met me at that moment and just poured out his love and grace and mercy on me. And he walked me through those next days and weeks and months and years. And God took that sinful thing that I did and he's done something remarkable in my marriage, in my family, and in my life. You see, I quit believing in the illusion of my own badness or my own goodness and I instead came to see myself not as bad or good, but as someone who was redeemed by the grace of our great God. And so I'm excited to preach this passage for you because I want you to find the same freedom in Christ Jesus that I found in the midst of my greatest failure. I hope that you can find it through the teaching of Paul and the word of God today. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Now, so far in this letter, Y'all may be tired of hearing it. We've been talking a whole lot about the law, right? You're probably sick of hearing about the law. You're like, that's, that's Old Testament. I'm not a Jew. Why do we have to keep hearing about the law? And it's because that's the thing that we often want to turn back to uh, instead of walking in what Paul's going to describe for us here. He says this in, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us Free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, he says it is for freedom that Christ set us free. God wants you to be free in your life, to not be bound by anything, but instead to walk in the freedom that Jesus Christ has for you, right? So I have four points I want to walk through rather quickly. The first point that we're going to see is is, uh, right here. It says this. It says, it is God's will for you to be free. Can you just hear that over your life right now? I don't know where you are or what your story is. If you're still in the myth of your own badness or the myth of your own goodness, it is God's will for you to be free. 
to experience freedom from the things that once held you back in your life. Many people have this misconception about God, and they think about, you know, if I get involved with church and God and Jesus, man, it's really gonna, it's gonna cramp my style. You know, I'm not gonna be able to enjoy my life and, and kind of have fun and do the things that I want to do. Listen, Jesus Christ, it is God's will that you would be free. And Jesus said, I came to earth so that they might have life, that's us, right? That we might have life and have it to the fullest. The richest, most satisfying, most abundant life you could ever possibly live here on this earth is the life of freedom in Christ Jesus. Jesus wants you to live it up, to live life to the fullest, and he's gonna show you how it happens through walking in the freedom that only he can provide. So number one, It's God's will for you to be free. Number two, if Jesus had to set us free from something, then that tells us that you and I, we were or we are enslaved to something. We were or we are enslaved to something. I mean, if if someone has to come and and save you or rescue you from captivity, you first have to be captive to something, right? Now, There's a couple of things that Paul's been addressing so far in Galatians that we can be enslaved to. The first is our flesh. You need to know this about yourself. You were created in the image of God. He knits you together in your mother's womb. You uh, look the way that you look. You have the personality that you have, the gifts that you have. You were born in the place that you were born into. All of that was on purpose. You were created in the image of God. God, but sin entered in. In, And when sin entered into our world, the beautiful image of God that we were created in was marred within us such that in our flesh, we desire things, not that lead to fullness and abundance and the riches that Christ had for us, but instead we desire the things that will ultimately destroy us. That is sin working within us. And some of you might be here today and you're like, that's me. I'm a slave to my flesh. The things that my body craves, man, that's what I give myself to. If I want it, I go get it. My, if I, my body tells me I need it, I have an appetite for it, I'm gonna go and satisfy that appetite. And you might be here today and that's you. And just trying to satisfy those appetites, you're chasing after every longing of your soul. But if you're here today and you're honest and you've lived very long, if you were really to get to the heart of it, you would probably acknowledge that though you've been indulging your appetites for most of your life, it's not rich and full and abundant. It hasn't satisfied you. It leaves you empty and it leaves you wanting something. So the first thing that can enslave us is our flesh, those sinful fleshly desires that lead to our destruction. But there's another thing that can enslave us. Many people who have who have lived it up. You know, they've gone and they've done life pretty well. They've, they have pursued the things of the world. When they come to faith in Christ, what often happens is that pendulum that was once over here, live it up, pursue the things of the flesh, because they never wanna go back there, the pendulum swings over here, and they're like, if I'm gonna avoid the things of the flesh, then I better obey the law. And we move away from indulging our flesh to living lives of legalism, where we're always asking ourselves the question, am I doing good enough. You, you know, when I was uh, in the, I thought I was good phase of my life, um, the, it felt really good to me who had always thought that I was bad. But the problem was I still did things wrong. Now I was up here on my pedestal of my own self-righteousness, looking down on those of you who said cuss words, right? Uh, however, if I was really honest, there was a lot of sinful stuff going on in my heart. And as much as doing the right things kind of made me feel good, I would do bad things that then left me feeling really, really bad. And you know what I've realized about that time? When, when you're living over here a life of legalism and self-righteousness, you're always focused on yourself and focused on your sin. I mean, that's no way to live, right? It's this up and down. When I'm doing good, I feel good about myself, but then I sin, I feel terrible about myself. And it's this ugly roller coaster that gets you nowhere. Well, 
Jesus doesn't want us focused on our sin or ourself. Instead, he wants us focused on our Savior, right? So Jesus desires, God desires for us to be free. We're enslaved to something. Maybe it's our flesh. Maybe it's this legalistic life that we're living under. But we don't want to be enslaved, right? Now, let's just, just take a moment here and think about your life. Paul, the Apostle Paul is going to describe something really important. I want, to, I want you just to evaluate yourself and be like, hey, which camp do I fall in? Maybe I've got a little of both. He says this in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to skip to verse 5. He says, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Amen, right? We're there. Verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Now, listen, if you're a preacher, there are certain passages of Scripture that you're like, well, you know, don't really want to teach on that. Circumcision is not the topic that you just get really jazzed to talk about. But Paul is using those things as representative of, of two ideas that they would have understood very well in Galatia. If you were a good Jew, you would have known that circumcision uh, was the, kind of the entry point. That's how you identified yourself as a good Jew. You said, I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to keep the law. I'm going to be circumcised. So it was kind of the beginning of this life of doing the right Thing. So in, in this context, you should think of circumcision as moral achievements. This is doing the right things. And you should think of uncircumcision like, you, like the Gentiles would have thought of it. So the Gentiles were actually referred to as uncircumcised sinners. They lived these rather hedonistic lifestyles, indulging their flesh, doing all sorts of things that the law prohibited. And so when you think about your life, you probably, you probably have kept a list in, in, in a sense. You keep a tally, right, of your moral achievements, the things that you've done really good that kind of puff you up, you know? Went on a mission trip, helped my neighbor out a little bit. Y'all, I, I did laundry for my wife. I'm killing it as a dad, as a father, whatever it is. We all have a list of moral achievements. But if we're honest, we also have a list of moral failures over here. And oftentimes, those moral failures, they haunt us. And maybe for you, your moral failures are really public and everybody knows what's happened. And maybe for you, they're still hidden. But they're not hidden from you. And you know what they are. And you carry them with you. And they weigh you down. And the Apostle Paul says something really interesting here that is critical for us to get if we're gonna understand the gospel. He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, no, neither moral achievements nor moral failures count for anything, but only faith working through love. Now, how could he say that? How could he say that our moral achievements and moral failures don't count for anything? Isn't that kind of what we're about in the church, like avoiding the bad things and doing more of the right things? Yes and no. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, and here is why. If, if you are thinking about those things, you are not thinking about your Savior. The reason the Apostle Paul can tell us that those things count for nothing is that those are the works of our flesh. However, in the gospel, which we receive by faith, our Moral achievements and moral failures don't count for anything because we now stand in the righteousness of Christ. Jesus Christ looked down on the world in all of our sin. And every one of us has sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. We have not lived the lives that even we have wanted to live. Jesus Christ stepped down from heaven and he took on flesh. And he endured, like the things that we endure, temptation, struggles, frustration, disappointment, heartache, rejection. Jesus endured all of that. And yet, in his life here, man, he kept the law perfectly. Moral achievements, perfectly achieved, right? 100%. And then when it came to this list of moral failures, Jesus didn't fall short at even one point. He was absolutely perfect. But then Jesus went to the cross and for those of us who come to faith in Jesus, what we know happened, what the gospel promises is that God takes all of our sins, 
past, present, and future. If, just to be clear, Jesus died 2,000 years ago on the cross. All of our sins were in the future when Jesus died, right? He died for all of our sins, past, present, and future. And when we come to faith in Jesus, our sins, God takes our sins and he placed them on Jesus. And there on the cross, Jesus bore the just punishment for our sin. He bore the punishment for your sin. You know that list of moral failures that you carry with you? Maybe it's for you the thing that causes you that shame. That was true of me. Jesus took those things and he atoned for them. He bore them on your behalf and the price has been paid in full on the cross. He bore them. And you know that life that you're just not doing well enough to live? Man, you're not enough of a man, not enough of a husband, not enough of a father, not enough of a friend or wife or mother or whatever it is, that those moral achievements that you know you should have done but you haven't done, Jesus completed all of those things. He lived a perfectly righteous life and God took his righteousness and he credited that to your account. The reason that Paul says, listen, circumcision or uncircumcision, your moral achievement or moral failures, they don't count for anything but only faith working through love is, that, is because of this. Through faith, God takes our sin and credits to us the perfect, righteous life of Christ. That's what we stand in. You're either going to stand in your works, your moral achievements and failures, or you're going to stand upon the finished work of Jesus, which was perfection, right? This is freedom. We are not accepted by God on the basis of our performance. We are accepted by God on the basis of the perfect righteousness of Jesus, right? That is extraordinary love. That's what I recognize in that moment of my greatest failure when I'm pouring out my heart to God and I think I've absolutely blown it and there's no more hope for me. I'm the guy that had every chance to get it right and still screwed it up. And yet in that moment, God was like, oh, you thought this was about you? No, no, no. Your moral achievements, your moral, those don't count for anything. The only thing that matters in this moment is faith, working its, out, its way out through love in your life. You see, when God meets you at your lowest moment, the God who takes away our sin and credits to us his righteousness, when he expresses that love to us, do you know that bursts within us? Love for God in return. That's my third point. See, it was God's will for you to be free. We were or we are enslaved to something. But point number three, Jesus Christ came to save us and set us free. He wants you to live in freedom from those things. Isaiah chapter 53 verses five and six says this. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All of us, this is true, all of us, like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. In Christ Jesus, Moral achievement and moral failure, they don't count for anything when it comes to our salvation. Instead, we are accepted solely on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. And on the basis of faith, we know that we are perfectly loved and perfectly accepted by God apart from any of our works. God's not looking at you and disappointed in you, wishing you would get your life together. God looks at you and loves you as he did his own son, Jesus Christ. With all of that said, I have a fourth point that is true, but it's unfortunately true. The fourth point is this. You will be tempted to abandon your freedom to return to slavery once again. You will be tempted to abandon the freedom that you have in Christ and return back to living a life of moral achievement, trying to feel good about yourself, or you'll be tempted to go back to your old way of life, believing that God doesn't really know what's best for you. He doesn't really want you to have full and abundant life. As a matter of fact, you'll believe that you can find it somewhere else. So Paul warns the Galatians. Look what he says in verse two. He says, look, 
I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, if you decide that you wanna obey the law again, he says, Christ will be of no advantage to you. He says, if you buy the false truth, the false teaching that Jesus isn't enough, that his sacrifice was not sufficient to save you fully, that you're, if you buy the lie that you're not accepted solely on the basis of faith, but you gotta perform again, man, if Jesus wasn't enough, what advantage is he to you? Why go through all of this and seek him? If he wasn't enough for you, why would you serve him as Lord? If you're gonna go back to living under the law, what was the, what was the purpose of the Savior? I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. If your justification before God is that I'm a law keeper, well, guess what? You gotta keep the whole law. And if you've broken it at even one point, you're a lawbreaker. It's not good enough. He says, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Man, if you buy the false narrative, the false teaching that Jesus isn't sufficient for you, that he isn't enough, that you need to add works to that, and you, you have missed the point of grace, and you have missed who Jesus is, and you have failed to live in the freedom that God has for you. He goes on, for through the Spirit by faith we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from God, by the way. It's not from one who called you. Instead, he says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish that those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. He's like, I wish that those people who are calling you back to the law, man, I wish they would just go ahead and go the whole way. He's using sarcasm here. He's like, if, if circumcision is so good for you, why not just take the next step, right? A little bit inappropriate to go any further uh, on that comment. He's just saying the law will never save you. And if Jesus is insufficient to save you from your sins, the law sure isn't gonna do it. There's no hope for you anymore. But look what he says in verse 13. He says, for you were called to freedom. You were called to be free in Christ Jesus where you're not afraid that if you sin one more time, then suddenly God's not gonna be able to save you anymore. Where you're not always afraid that God's gonna punish me, man, I deserve judgment, I'm gonna be condemned if I don't do enough of the good things and avoid enough of the bad things, it's all gonna go bad. He's like, listen, you are supposed to be free, and here's what that freedom does for you. When, when there's no more fear of punishment in your life, when there's no more fear of rejection, but you live in the freedom of the perfect love and acceptance of God, guess what? You are now free to love God and to do so well. And he says, now, don't use that freedom to go back to your old way of life. You know that was sinful and destructive. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Y'all know the two greatest commandments, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law is fulfilled in one word, love. Do you know why we love God? because he first loved us. And a God who found us in our sin at our worst moment, who saw all of the things that we're super ashamed of and just how far, uh, how far short our good works fell, but cho chose to die for us anyway, man, that God would do that for us and love us in that way, it motivates us to love him in, and others in return. Tim Keller tells the story, or he, he says this quote quite a bit. He, he says that basically you know that you've begun to understand the gospel rightly when you fear that people are going to abuse it. You know that you're beginning to understand the gospel rightly when you begin to fear that people are gonna abuse it. Isn't this kind of reckless of God to extend such grace and love and require nothing in return? The answer is yes. And for many of us, the reason we're tempted to go back to slavery is we believe the gospel's too good to be true. 
A perfect God dying for imperfect people? A perfect God dying for imperfect me? Extending love like this? Grace like this? Maybe it's not enough. When you believe the gospel in faith, it leads you to love him. When you understand the God of the universe has lavished his love and grace and mercy upon you, it leads you to love him, and that love transforms you. Spurgeon tells a story, Charles Spurgeon, he, he tells a story of a, a farmer. He was a, a gardener who uh, had a good year, and he grew the greatest carrot he had ever grown. And when he sees the carrot, he, he thinks, hey, greatest carrot I've ever grown, I wanna present this to my king. And so that farmer, he, he dug that carrot up and he cleaned it up and he, he took it to the king, went into the king's court and he said, king, you are my king and I love you. This is the greatest carrot I've ever grown. I want you to have this carrot. And the king accepts the carrot and as the man turns and walks away, he said, uh, you've done a great thing for me on this day and I wanna do something for you. He said, uh, I wanna give you an acre of land right next to your garden so that you can go and be more fruitful and continue to, to, to do the thing that you love and grow great carrots. And the man went away delighted at this unexpected blessing from his king. Well, there was a nobleman in the court who heard this and he thought to himself, if that man got an acre of land in exchange for a carrot, I wonder what I could get for a horse. So he went home that evening and he selected his best horse the next morning, he brings it to the king, and he said, King, this is my greatest horse. I love you, and I want you to have this horse. So the king thanked him, and as the man walked off, the king discerned what was really going on. And he stopped the man, and he said, I realize what's going on here. He said, Yesterday, you saw me give that man an acre in exchange for a carrot. He said, But that man actually came to give me a carrot. Today, you came to give yourself a horse. And the thing that that reminds us of, the thing that that points us to in our lives is that anything we have ever done for God, seeking salvation, seeking God's favor, we haven't really done for God at all. We actually did it for ourselves. Freedom in Christ, fully accepted, fully loved, frees us to actually offer to God our true and pure worship in love. If you fed the hungry and clothed the naked in order to get into heaven, you haven't done anything for God or the hungry or the naked. You did it for yourself. But if you know that you are loved and accepted on the, grace, on the basis of God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, then anything that we then do before God is offered to him as true worship. We don't have to serve God to be accepted. We serve God because we are accepted. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Don't go back and accept the yoke of slavery again. Don't be burdened by it. Live out the freedom that Jesus Christ died to purchase for you. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the love that you show to us. Lord, it is beyond our comprehension to fathom the, the height and the depth and the breadth of your love for us. But Lord, may you give us a, a, a greater understanding each and every day. Help us to, to know and to love you more and that we might be a people who serve you out of gratitude for what you have done and not out of fear, not out of longing for the things that we desire. God, help us to see that we are fully accepted on the basis of faith and that that faith ought to work itself out through love in our lives. God, may you do this in us. For the person here that doesn't know you, I pray that today might be the day of salvation. For the person here who's living in a false understanding, I pray that today is the day they lay down the things that have been holding them back. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Right now, I'm gonna invite you to stand, to stand and respond and maybe you're here today and the thing that's been enslaving you is that old sin. Maybe it's your moral failures and it's been weighing you down. Maybe you're living a life of shame. Here's the thing that I wanna invite you to do. Lay those failures down at the foot of the cross. Jesus died for every one of those things. And maybe you're here today and the thing that's holding you back is your own sense of your own goodness. 
the illusion of your own goodness is keeping you from worshiping and understanding the fullness of the love of God. And maybe today you need to lay your own goodness down at the foot of the cross and embrace Jesus and his good work on your behalf. Whatever that is, I wanna invite you to respond in obedience to Jesus. If you don't know Christ, I would love to visit with you more. I'll be right down here. But take these next few moments to worship the Lord for his goodness to you.